Matthew 28, Matthew 28, preacher going to be preaching fast, a lot of stuff. Second chances, that, the video said second chances. You know, there are a lot of things I could preach on today, you know that. Last week we dealt with uh, two of the cries from the cross, what he said. And uh, Pastor Mike and I was talking about it on the way here, my pastor who lives up in Illinois. And we were talking about the thief on the cross and what a blessing that moment was for him to look over and realize that what he had sought for was sitting in the middle. And Jesus gave him a second chance. All through Scripture, you see second chances. You ought to thank God for a second chance. You know, as humans, you need a second chance. Third, fourth, fifth. I did a funeral yesterday of a woman who was 35,770 days old. I'm saying it again. She was 35,770 days old. I know you're trying to calculate that, ain't you? She was 98 years old. And I thought to myself, getting up out of bed, getting ready, and pressing through a day 35,770 times. You ought to thank God he don't tell you how many you're getting before you get here. Amen. Just get up in the morning and get going. Can I get an amen? Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Are you comfortable? Matthew 28, verse 1. Today, we're going to just kind of move past the, the sayings from the cross. We'll get back to that later. I've got lots of time for that. Again, they were the things that literally changed my, my course of life the first time I heard anyone preach on the seven sayings from the cross, and that was in 1980. Amen. First, my first Easter, 1980, I was 19 years old. When I heard it, I'm 61 years old now, and I still just look back on those days, and I thank God for those moments. And this could be your moment. This could be one of those crossroads where you come into church and and you hear something, and it affects and changes your life forever. Matthew 28, verse 1 says, After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, let me just say this to you. I'm not going to argue with you over the word Easter or Christmas or when his real birthday was or when the resurrection was. I mean, if you put Jesus in the grave at, nine, uh, at 3 o'clock on a Friday and give him 72 hours, it ain't Sunday morning. It's the first day of the week. Amen. So for us, that would be on a Monday. So, again, we're not trying to split Holy Ghost hairs here. We're just trying to tell you that it's about the resurrection. Amen. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. We're talking about the, the one that's a prostitute. Went to the, look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. I want you to imagine. For three days, they haven't heard a shudder. For three days, it's been quiet. For three days, there's been weeping, crying, and wondering, where's the Messiah? For three days, Mary and Mary go to the tomb. We also know that his mother goes there, and Peter, John, getting a foot race to go there. But at this moment, Scripture declares, Matthew said, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. That's that Marvel moment. Huh? That's Thor. The Bible describes an, a scene where an angel was so heavy, now, not with weight, but with power, that when he descended from the heavens and hit the earth, boom, it shook. And there was an earthquake. I mean, you got to I, I imagine these things. He came down from heaven and, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone. Now, watch the com this little comedy here, and he sat on it. He comes down, boom, hits here. The earthquake takes place. Then he rolled, the, the earthquake didn't move the stone. The angel rolled the stone away. And by the way, wonder where them guards were that were guarding it. Hmm. His appearance, the angel, was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, let me do, it's, it's so much to preach here. It's too much to preach. You, you remember when the guards got back and Pilate said, where's Jesus? They said they, the, his, his disciples came and took him. <laughs> says here, you look like a dead man. The angel said to the woman, don't be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. 
just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples, he's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Pastor, why is this so important today? Because it answers everything for us. It answers guilt. It answers doubt. It answers loneliness. It answers death. His resurrection answers all of these things. Father, I thank you for your word. Anoint my lips and to quickly preach something that's going to impact your people. In Jesus' name, and everybody shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. I hope you're as excited as I am. Did you get? Did, are you excited? I said, Are you excited? Oh, I am. It's something that this day means everything to us. I'm an apologist for Easter. I, I, I love apologetics. It tells us about defending the gospel. Now, I, I love holidays, actually, in general. But I'm going to tell you that in our society today, there are two great holidays. Of course, they're Easter and Christmas. And if Easter had not happened, Christmas would have no meaning. Amen. Had he not resurrected, then his birth wouldn't have mattered. If Easter had not happened, Christmas would not would be nothing more than a sweet-sounding fable. If Easter is not true, then Christmas is only the story of an obscure baby born in an out-of-the-town out of way. Amen. Forgotten land 2,000 years ago. It's the great miracle of this resurrection season that gives Christmas its true meaning. Perhaps there is no mystery in the universe so monumental as God dying a death of shame to redeem mankind who were shamed. Amen. It's what God did. But it's only... Uh, you know, that I meet people that, that get a little mixed up. I talk with folk all the time about different religions. You know that we have a youth camp out at the ranch, so we get all kind of different groups in. And, and modern men and women ask with great sincerity, how can I know which religion is the right one? And it's a good question. I, I went and I Googled religions, and I, I literally found hundreds and hundreds of religions that people have worshipped at. But it removes all the doubt from my life when I read it. The average person today faces a, a, a veritable supermarket of religions from which to choose. I, I've gone into grocery stores. My wife said, pick up cereal. It'd be like sending one of you ladies into a, 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 and say, get me a, a quart of oil. There's so many to choose from. They're everywhere. Amen. Just so much stuff. And, and, and so we have this problem. They, they've got written scriptures. So do we. They, they have miracle stories. So do we. They have high ethical standards. So do we. They have a long and rich history. So do we. And, and so a casual shopper would be excused for assuming that all religions are basically the same. But they're not. The pyramids of Egypt are famous because they contain the mummified bodies of ancient Egyptian kings. The Westminster Abbey in London is renowned because it is the, rest of, uh, the resting place of bodies of English nobles and notables. Muhammad's tomb is noted for the stone coffin and the bones which it contains. Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. is revered for it is the honoring place of many outstanding Americans. There is, however, all the difference in the world between the tomb of Jesus and these places which we've just mentioned. They are famous and they draw visitors from afar because of what they contain. While the garden tomb is famous because it's empty. There, there's one fundamental difference in all those religions, one fact that sets Christianity forever apart from every other religious system. You go to their tombs of the founders and you give a roll call. Muhammad, here. Moses, here. Buddha, here. Confucius, here. Jesus. Oh. I said, Jesus. Je There's no answer because he's no longer there. His tomb is empty. Which religion is the right religion? How can you be sure? Just go to the one whose founder rose from the dead. That religion has to be the truest. Which bottle in the religious supermarket is pure? Drink from the one that says live in water. Drink from the one that has a guarantee of life ahead. Drink from the one that says eternally. Amen. I love you. For second, for 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 15, verse 12. I'm so excited. Now, now let me ask you something profound. This is Paul talking. Let me ask you something profound, yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation, that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there's no such thing as a resurrection? If there's no resurrection, there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. And everything you staked your life on 
is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrication if there's no resurrection. My friend, this day is so important because your faith rests on the resurrection. Amen. Every, when I did that funeral yesterday and I did one last Saturday and I did one the week before, I'm telling you, I stand there with great confidence knowing that there is a resurrection of the dead. Amen. Because our Savior resurrected, we too will resurrect. Can I get an amen? Someone once said that no doctrine of the Scripture is so easy to prove as the doctrine of human depravity. We see evidence all around us. The empty tomb answered the question of guilt. We live in guilt. I, I'll be honest, not all of you, but probably a couple of you showed up today just out of guilt. Amen. Wondering about, you know, your own, your own, what's going on in your own life. You pick up a newspaper, you turn on the TV, listen to the radio, think of the people you work with every day, or, or better yet, look in the mirror. The evidence is so plain that no honest person can deny it. The reason we feel guilty is because we are guilty. Somebody said to me the other day, Pastor, why does bad things happen to good people? I said, I I've never met good people. I've met people who were born again. I've met people, is, you know, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Yeah. Amen. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. That's what he came for. Romans 3.23 says, for all sin comes short of the glory of God. I think we're all in the all version. There's no exceptions there. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. That's it. There's no one who can claim that they've lived an absolutely sinless life except for Christ himself. Amen. When, when you look at life on, on this planet, there's so many opportunities to mess up, to slip, to fall. And many times condemning, pointing fingers at self-righteous people stand, look over you as if somehow their sin was different than yours. Let me tell you something. There are ways people have for handling their guilt. There's only one way I know, and it's to give it to Jesus. Amen. But there's several ways. First, first people try to do good. Oh, we got, we got a lot of good. And I'm not against doing good. Doing good's good. David, y'all did good this week. Went up and worked with a, a former, uh, I mean, a pastor friend of yours and remodeled a lot of his stuff. You did good. But, but that won't get you to heaven. Mm-mm, that just gets your shower fixed. They hope, you know, people do good. They try to hope to even the scale, so to speak, by being uh, model mothers, exceptional fathers. They work in the, the scouts, amen, and, and they continue to con to the community chest. They, they give to the local need here in town, the United Way. They mow the lawns. I've done that. Amen for other people to pay debt. They work hard on the job. In short, they're fine, upstanding citizens who help make the world a better place. And they hope and pray that by doing good deeds, they may find freedom, forgiveness, and a release from the guilt they feel within. Second, some people try to cover their guilt through the pursuit of pleasure. For these people, life is one nonstop fraternity party. Mm. See, our problem is if we abuse grace, then, then all of a sudden we get into a place where we start uh, just kind of living up our lives in such a way that we believe in hope. And here's my, hey, I got to say this, I believe in what the thief on the cross, when he asked for forgiveness at that moment, when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I believe in that. But why would you waste your whole life partying when you could live for God, amen, and connect other people and get to heaven and make sure that your family's there because you live for God. That's so important to me. I, I've had such a, an abundant blessing for 40 years serving Jesus, I can't imagine being in the world and having any more fun. Well, say, Pastor, don't you miss getting drunk? Well, no. No, I don't miss it. I don't miss hugging the commode. Having my brother grab me by the hair of the head and pull me out in the yard so my mom and dad don't wake up. I don't miss wrecking my car and running off behind the Church of Christ and getting stuck. No, I don't miss none of that. That's just what we did when we were young. Amen. But as I got older, I realized the need for Christ is so important. So, second, people, again, they go through it. For these people, life is a nonstop fraternity. Amen. Everything is happiness, lights, music. They laugh. They, they talk. They keep on moving. They, they are in perpetual motion because they fear that if the lights are ever turned off, if the laughter ever stops, if the noise dies down, they will have to face the hard facts of life. And that's why some people turn to alcohol, drugs, pills, uppers, downers, artificial stimulus of every kind. It's the only way they can deaden the deep inner hurt they've got and the guilt they carry. Third, some people turn to various religions. I looked them up. 
Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Baha Faith, Taism, Hinduism, uh, Sikhism, Slavic uh, Neo Paganism, Wicca, Satanism, Hellenism, Jehovah Witness, Scientology, Unitarian, Confucianism. Not to mention the Church of Euthanasia, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, Church of the uh, Sergenius, Dudism, and last 30 isms. There's a lot of religions out there you can join with, but only one that has a resurrected Savior. Can I get an amen? All these answers, they, they fall short because they don't deal with the root problem, which is sin. The true moral guilt that exists between all humanity and the Holy God. You can't be good enough to erase your guilt. You can't laugh enough to drown out your guilt. You can't pray enough to cover your guilt. Amen. It can't be done. Only this resurrection that Jesus did, amen, solves the problem of guilt. Well, Pastor, but I thought we, it was his death that saved us. Do you know the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture? I understand that he died for our sins. That's good. But had he not resurrected, had he not resurrected, there would have been no forgiveness for us. Everything hinged on that dark third day. That's the only true because Christ rose from the dead. If Jesus is still in the tomb, then we're still in our sins. If Jesus did not rise, then the Romans and the Jewish leaders were right when they crucified him. If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, then Calvary was just another execution of well-meaning but misguided religious leader. Without the empty tomb, Good Friday wasn't good. Amen. The death of Jesus forgives sins, but only because the resurrection of Jesus made it effective. I thank God. Today, I realize, you know, there are over 2 billion believers in the world that are gathering today. Probably more than that. Talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. The empty tomb answers the question not only of doubt and guilt, but what about loneliness? Men and women across the world, where, where can I find a friend? How, and this is one of the things that hits me so hard. Eternity is too long for you just to have your neighbor as a friend. You already don't like your neighbor that much. Make friends. Connect with people. For God's sake, connect with people. Amen. The Bible says we'll be known as we're known when we get to heaven. We'll know one another. And if this is all we know, then eternity is going to be a long time. Amen. So I, I'm, I'm always on this thing about connecting. And, and you know, and you say, Pastor, funerals, weddings. Yes, they help me connect. I want this large group of people. I want to know them when I get there. Amen. It's so important. And here we in life, we move through this fast lane. We get up, we get dressed, we go to work, we come home, we unwind, we eat supper, watch TV, we go to bed, we get up tomorrow morning. We do it all over again. We live in such a fearful society now, particularly the last few years, that we never really get to know our neighbors. We put up fences, shrubs, security systems to protect our privacy. People move in and out so fast that we can hardly know that they were there, much less they moved away. Hundreds and thousands of people across Harris and Montgomery and surrounding counties, they go to bed each night with burdens they carry on, on top of them. They have no friends to share it with, nobody to connect with. People wonder what hell's going to be like. T.S. Eliot said this. He said, the great void, the land of ugly, this is hell to him, the ugly nothingness we might imagine. Imagine as one place in the universe where you are utterly, totally, and eternally alone. You scream and no one answers. You cry for help, but no one hears. You're falling, falling, falling through the darkness, and you're alone. That's what hell will be like, a place of utter loneliness, not to mention the fire, amen, the separation, the cry out for God. I think we'll remember in hell just like we would in heaven. Again, it's an awful reality, but on this side of the cross, I know, not while he was living in the earth suit, but when he moved over to this side and he got his heavenly wear, Jesus said, I'll never forsake you. You know, I, I thank God for my friends. I do. I, for years, I used to say, I just want to live in such a way and have at least six guys that would be willing to carry my coffin. And then going through a little bit of hell on earth, I decided I'd be cremated. The truth is, I need friends and you need friends too. But if everybody forsakes you, you have one that will always be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. After he'd already come back from the dead, he shared those words. They have meaning. Listen, and they only have meaning because he's alive. Amen. I'll never leave you. The empty tomb answered the question of doubt, of doubt, guilt, loneliness, and the big one, death, death. Uh, 
Yesterday, I spent time after the funeral walking through the tombs and looking at tombstones and reading people's dash. And I realized you're not going to be remembered for the work you did here. You won't be remembered for a lot of things. Let me say, let me reverse that. What you will be remembered for is how you treated people, how you loved and how you forgave. Amen. That's the impact that's going to take place. 4,000 years ago, Job asked a question. 4,000 years ago, Job 14, 14, if a man dies, will he live again? It didn't matter much to me when I was 15, 20, 25, 30. But now in my 60s, I look over life, and I think with Job, if a man dies, will he live again? It's the greatest of all questions. He had not the theology that you and I have. He didn't have the ability to look it up through Scripture. He was living out Scripture. He was walking through it. It's a central question. Every experience in the cold, clammy, Wax and fill of death. There's no movement. That's why I tell people all the time it's an earth suit. And when that spirit is gone, when the seed of that person is gone, amen, that's it. And you don't know, don't tell me, I'm going to get off on something. Don't tell me when you see a little baby, you know what they're going to look like when they're 60. Some of you, I saw your high school pictures. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Yeah, it, here's the thing. When you put a seed in the ground, you don't know what it's going to, unless you know what the seed is, you don't know what that tomato going to look like. Amen. Corn, watermelon. It's a seed. Amen. And with Jesus, when you're born, you, you, you're like, like a seed. You're from a seed. You come up as a human, and then you grow up, and you, and you start changing. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we plant these bodies in the ground? What God has plan for us and what we'll look like the bible says we'll look like who we look like but the, our body's going to be so much different amen with that heavenly touch it's the last enemy that's going to be put down again when, when i look at the i know it's a cold word the carcass and then I'll, I'll go further than humans i'd put my horse down i had to put my dogs down there's that you missed the life that was in that one you missed the life that was in the animal. You missed the life that was in your father, your, your sister, your mother. You, you, you missed the life that was in your spouse. You missed that life. But you know this, is that his resurrection told me that I will see them soon. This life will soon be over. Amen. It's the last enemy, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Deep in our hearts, we wonder how we will do when our time comes to cross the great divide. How will it be with us when we have to go through the valley of the shadow of death? Amen. Will we be afraid? Will our faith stand the test? What happens when we pass? Does Easter answer the question of death, Pastor? If it doesn't, then everything else is just a sham. My friend, Easter has already arrived. The tomb is empty. Joseph, if you'd come on up. King David ended his 23rd Psalm with the assurance that we would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We would dwell. He said it. David said, we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. John 14, Jesus said, trust in God, trust also in my Father's house are many rooms. If we're not so, I would have told you. They both talk about this house, this, this dwelling place, this connection. Amen. That this life here is over quickly. Too quick. <sighs> Too quick. Listen to me. A faith that doesn't help you when you're dying won't be much good for you when you're living. I said a faith that doesn't help you when you are dying won't be much good to you when you're living. When Jesus walked out of the tomb, the people of God walked out with him. It's an amazing, again, biblical story. We'll talk about it in the next few weeks. I love the old song. I don't know many of the songs. I wasn't brought up in church, but I did hear it a few times. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah. Jesus arose. The empty tomb says he's risen. The disciples said he was risen. The church of Jesus says he's risen. Creation says he's risen. Jesus has conquered our last enemy. He solved a deep human problem that we've got. 2 Timothy 1.10 says, But it has now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death 
and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Pastor, hold on. It says there that he destroyed death. Well, if he destroyed death, Kenny, why are we still dying? It's a good question. The issue is, if you notice that you're still aging, can you imagine what you'd look like in another 60, 70 years? When I, when I, when I was at, listen to me, when I was there yesterday, man, it was like an epiphany. This lady that passed was 98 years old. She had outlived most of her pastors, all seven of her brothers, her family. Both her daughters were in the 70s and early 80s. I say to myself, Lord, I, I don't want to live any longer than you want me here until my purpose is complete. The word translated destroyed means rendered powerless, which simply means to transition from this life to the next life for the believer is powerless. That death has no sting. It has no victory. There's nothing to for a believer. When you, and again, I will tell you, it's the grace of God that covers our life. And when we leave this life to the next, it's just simply a transition. Yes, we miss those who've gone on. But it's simply a transition of where we're heading. When Jesus rose from the dead, he broke the power of death forever. And one day, death itself will testify. Amen. It will die. Until then, death has taken on a new meaning for every believer. Amen. Powerless. Jesus said in John eleven twenty six, 26, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Death for the believer is a temporary interruption, a passing from one stage of life to the next. So what is it that Paul meant when he declared that for me to live is Jesus and for me to die is gain? you got so much time here to live for Jesus, and death will be gain for you. Everybody say gain. Come on, say it again. It's gain, man. It's not loss. It's gain. Paul's consider that matter of fact surrounding the Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Did Jesus not die? Yes. Was he not buried? Yes. Did the woman not weep at his grave? Yes. Where then is our hope? It rests not on that Good Friday. Or the long hours and the lonely hours in between. Our only hope may be found on this day that we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. Amen. There is the good news. That death could not hold him. That the grave could not keep him. Amen. That he is the Lord of life, the king, immortal and eternal. How did he destroy death? He could only conquer death by entering the realm of death, yanking the keys from the hands of the devil, unlocking the door, and marching out on that resurrection triumphant over the grave. Revelation 1, 18. I am the living one. I was dead. Come on, Jesus. Testify. I'm the living one. I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and hell. That's what today's about, my friend. I know many of your memories. Go, I mean, I, I look over. I, I take my glasses off. I get frustrated with them. You're a fuzzy figure right now. And that's okay. But I've done so many funerals and memorials for so many people inside this building. And I can tell you, I stand here with great hope and encourage you to keep living. Man, it's been, it's been 25 years or longer, Verlin. But Jack, you sitting by Jeanette. Jeanette, I mowed around Jimmy's memorial stone you put out at the ranch. You worked with me, was it 2011? It's 2011? Is that when he... Jimmy passed July 4th what year when did your husband die you don't remember I'm not going to tell him about it when we get to heaven I know he's in your heart that's all it's a good cover it covers well but I look out among the people and I realize without the resurrection there would be no hope it's his resurrection. It's what he did. It's hope. It's our hope. It's the hope we stand on. If a man dies, will he live again? Yes, 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 yes. It's the answer to the greatest question, the deepest question, the final question of all who will face death someday. But for those who know Christ, death holds no fear. We're not afraid of the darkness for darkness. For Jesus is the light of the world. We don't fear the valley of the shadow of death. 
for Jesus has said he'll be our guide. We may die, but we won't stay dead. Jesus has the keys. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. April 1980. Been born again about six months when I heard this story literally for the first time. And every year it's new to me. It gets more exciting to me. It holds the answer to me. When I meet people and I talk with them, talking about Jesus is a natural thing. Amen. He changed my life. It changed yours. Whether you came with relatives today, friends out of curiosity, whatever, I just need to ask you this question. If you're not sure that he took away from your life guilt, doubt, loneliness, and holds the key to your eternity, you're not sure, put your hand up right now. Heads are bowed. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. You're not sure. Put your hand up right now. I'm not calling you up here. I just want you to throw your hand in the air and recognize it. Thank you, sir. Amen. Anyone else? On this Resurrection Sunday, pray this with me. Forgive me of my sins. Come on, say it loud. Forgive me of my sins, my failures, my shortcomings. Fill me with your love. Wash me with your blood. Thank you for your mercy. Write my name in your book. I'm forever grateful and thankful for your resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're sitting, give him the best praise you can. Amen. In your seat right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. His worst day was my best day. His worst day was my best day. Amen. Oh, how he changed my life. How he changed yours. Hallelujah. Thief on the cross. That thief never got a chance. Didn't get a chance to get off the cross, get baptized, didn't get a chance to do any good. All he had was remember me. I can't tell you how many people I've prayed for over the years. They had just that moment. But you got a different one. You got a chance to live for him now. Amen? Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up, let me see who's here now. Okay. The fuzzy figures are getting clearer now. Let me mention this to you. If you could read this for me, 1 Corinthians 15, and if you'd look it up in the Message Bible, not right now or but sometime this week. 1 Corinthians 15. I almost backed off this message and just read a chapter to you this morning. Joseph, that's how powerful it was. I'm sitting in my office, I'm reading this, and I'm going, I, I, I don't think I've ever caught this before. And Paul goes on to explain this resurrection, and he said the issue is, is that you, you struggle with the seed because you don't know what the seed will become. Can, can I tell you that the Scripture goes on and calls this seed? And that if I plant this seed, you don't know what it's going to become. You don't know how it's going to come back to you. Amen. You don't know what favors it works in your life. Plant seed. All week long, it's not just on Sunday morning, do I plant my tithe and my offering. But I look for opportunities to plant seed. I look for people that might need something. And I plant seed in their life. Because I don't know that someday I might need a ride. And that seed comes back as an automobile. I might need a place to stay. And that seed comes back as a, as a night in a friend's house. Amen. I don't know how that seed's going to come back, but I've learned to plant seed. Amen. Your life right now is a seed. And one day it'll be planted. My first funeral was a 17-year-old young boy killed in a drunk driving accident. I preached a message that day. When I see young people like this young man from Hardin that's here today, and I apologize for calling you mud flap. It's just I don't see mullets all the time. And I'm a mullet dude. All right. But I preached that funeral, and over 300 teenagers from Chandler View High School showed up. And that message was the corn in the coffin. He was a seed. A tragic tragedy 
corn went into the ground. And from that seed, watch this, sprang all the churches that I have pastored. Everyone that grew up came from that one seed. His name was Sean McLean. I've never forgotten Sean. Amen. It, because after that, it was such a moving moment to look out and see 300 teenagers packed into a building. This is in Channel View. Some of you may be familiar with this from many years ago, Mr. Terry. Amen. But I looked down and I saw this young man passing. I said, I will not allow his death to be in vain. That's how I feel about people. And at times when the seed goes in the ground, you don't know what's going to happen. From that, I had 14, 13 kids in my youth group when that young man died. I had 15 until that wreck. The next week I had 40 kids. The next week I had 60 kids. The next week I had 80 kids. The next week I had 100 kids, 120 kids coming to this crazy brag youth group getting saved. From that, a church sprang out. From that, another church and another church. You never know. Don't take it for granted. You've lost, you never lost them, but you've had loved ones that have passed. And I say this in comfort. You believe God, they seed that went into the ground, and good things are going to come from that. Can I get an amen? Amen. You got your offering there in front of you? Thank you, guys. You got your offering in front of you there? Amen. As they go around, as we give today, we're believing God for? More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission. Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. If you don't know it, Joseph's dad's up here on the front row. Officer, good to have you here. Amen.